reading from the Gospel of Mark. There we go. Very early in the morning, the chief priests and the elders, the teachers of the law and the whole Sanhedrin made their plans. So they bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Are you the king of the Jews? asked Pilate. You've said so, Jesus replied. The chief priests accused him of many things. So Pilate asked him, aren't you going to answer? See how many things they are accusing you of? But Jesus still made no reply, and Pilate was amazed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Over the last several weeks, we have been in this journey through the Gospel of Mark, and we've looked at very specific events or actions on the part of Jesus and in his life. But today, we're not going to do that. Today, we're going to look at an attitude, a feeling, a response to Jesus and who he was. Because time and time again, Mark tells us that there are people who were amazed at Jesus. Have you ever been amazed? Not just excited. It goes well beyond excited. Amazement is something that captivates your whole being. It's a unique response to a life-altering, life-changing event. So have you ever been amazed? I've seen it a few times and experienced it a few times. You probably have too. I've stood with countless grooms at my side when the back door is open and the bride steps into the sanctuary and their eyes go wide, usually with tears, and they are amazed. I've seen it when a mother holds her newborn child for the first time. And I pray everyone who has come to know God's love in Jesus and the reality of the forgiveness of their sins and eternal life has been amazed at the love that God has given to them. It has nothing to do with wealth, nothing to do with social status, nothing to do with your own abilities. It has everything to do with the reality that you know in that moment of your life, you are blessed. And because of that, you are amazed. That's how people responded to Jesus over and over again. Matter of fact, Mark speaks of it more than any other gospel writer. And there are different circumstances which cause this kind of response, this amazement on the part of the people. Sometimes it's because of how Jesus teaches And Jesus traveled all through Judea and primarily in Galilee and he went to the synagogues and he preached and he taught and he went to the hillsides and to the shores of the sea and he taught at every opportunity and it always keeps going back. The people were amazed. Now, often it says they were amazed at his authority. He taught one with authority. That's because he simply taught the word of God. He didn't lightly mention the word and then sprinkle in all kinds of human wisdom and philosophy. He didn't twist the word into his own personal interpretation. He simply proclaimed the word of God and let it stand on its own. And the people were amazed. Matter of fact, Jesus even tells us about his preaching and about his teaching, that it's not his word. Listen to what he says. For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me gave me a command that I should say of what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his command is everlasting life. Therefore, whatever I speak, just as the Father has told me, so I speak. Jesus tells us he came for the purpose of giving God's word to us, his Father's word. And when he proclaimed that word precisely, clearly, truly, the response of the people was they were amazed. People were often amazed at his ability to heal. He would travel from town to town and village to village, and and it says all the time that Jesus was healing. In fact, Mark tells us 14 times Jesus healed people. Sometimes we're just given kind of a group account. Jesus healed the multitudes that were brought. 
Our people are bringing sick to Jesus, the sick to Jesus, and he healed them. Sometimes it's very specific. Jesus healed the cripple, cured the leper, restored the sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, and the people were always amazed. That's why we call him the great physician. But it's also important for us to understand that not every single person in Israel was healed when Jesus walked among them. Some never found their way to Jesus. Some never tried. People died and there were funerals every day. Jesus healed as people came, but that wasn't his primary purpose for coming into this world. He had come to give healing, but not physical healing. He had come to give spiritual healing which would ultimately result in the physical healing of every single person who believed in him. In our day of modern medicine and technology, we often forget that God is in the midst of healing. We trust in the doctor as we should. We take the medications as they prescribe. We go to the specialist, they use their tools and their techniques, and we're thankful for those things, but we need to remember that it is our God who promises to heal. And whatever method he uses, when, a, when someone's health and life are restored, we should stand every bit as amazed today as those who saw Jesus heal with a single touch. And we know the world we live in is broken. We know life in this world is short. We know that barring the Lord's return, every single one of us are going to face the last day of our life in this world. Death will come. We don't like to talk about it. We don't like to think about it. But we know it's true. But even in that, we should stand amazed. Because even if death comes to us before the Lord returns, we know because God has said it, Jesus has made it possible that death is not the end. Life is. The apostles proclaim boldly, all who die in Christ abide in faith and hope. And on the day that Jesus does come back and the resurrection happens, you will be raised to life and your very body will be completely, fully restored, made whole. That is God's promise to you. So even as we face our own mortality, We can stand amazed because of God's love and the promise that he's made to us in his son. Sometimes as Jesus traveled around, people were just amazed because of what they heard about him. I mean, their their stories of Jesus started spreading. It was good gossip. Everybody's going around talking about this Jesus and what he was doing. And often it was personal witness or personal testimonies, those who had heard him teach were telling others about it. Or those who had been crippled or blind and were healed were testifying to what Jesus had done for them. Sometimes those who were demon-possessed went and confessed what God had done for them in delivering them and that the demons themselves knew who Jesus was. People were proclaiming boldly the love that God has that he's showing to the world in Jesus. And they were amazed. Several years ago, a young couple named Rich and Patty White wanted to adopt a baby. As many young couples do, they looked around and they could go to a local adoption center, but they thought with their their heart of faith, they wanted to, to do something for someone who had no chance. So they decided to adopt a child from a third world country. And, you know, you've heard the stories of what it's like to adopt kids here in the States, how hard it is. It's much more different in a third world country. Many plane flights back and forth, many correspondence with lawyers and attorneys and all the government regulations and visas and passports and all that kind of stuff. But the day finally came when they had their appointment before the judge for the adoption. They stood behind the child with the attorneys there in front of the bench as the judge read his order. And I want you to hear just a couple of lines of it. Inasmuch as Alana Morgan is orphaned and is unwanted by anyone in this country, inasmuch as no citizen of this country wants Alana Morgan, 
or wishes to have her as part of their family. And when the recitation from the judge was over, custody was awarded to the whites, and they immediately fell down on their knees and hugged their new daughter, Olana, and said, you will never again hear the words, unwanted, spoken over you. You see, we should stand amazed that God wants us. I want to share with you two specific accounts of amazement in the Bible, in the Gospel of Mark. We have lots of accounts of people being amazed, but there's only one time when Jesus is recorded as having been amazed by something. And it was a pretty big something. You see, Jesus had been traveling and teaching, and he decided to go home. Now, you know, when he became, when he was baptized by John in the Jordan, he made it Capernaum on the northern sea of the Sea of Galilee his kind of hub for his mission work, for his ministry. But he was raised in Nazareth. So Jesus decides to travel to Nazareth, and news gets there ahead of time that he's on his way. And everybody in town's excited. I mean, he's the small town, hometown boy that's made it good. Okay? Everyone's excited for Jesus, this famous boy, to come home back to where he was raised. And they were all turning out to greet him. And when he went into the synagogue, the synagogue was full of people. And he took the scroll and he read it to them and he began to teach them. And the more he taught, it says, the people got offended at him. What had caused people in other places to be amazed as he proclaimed the word was offensive to the people of, Galilee, of, of Nazareth. The reason? They couldn't get past what they thought about Jesus. I mean, after all, they'd seen him grow up. They knew him as a young boy. They knew his parents. They knew his siblings. How could this Jesus be the Messiah? How could this Jesus that we've known all of our lives be the Son of God in human flesh? You see, they couldn't see the forest for the trees. They were caught up on their idea of who Jesus is, and it says they were offended at him. And the text responds, and Jesus was amazed at their lack of faith. The only time it ever says in all the Gospels that Jesus was amazed, he was amazed at their lack of faith. You see, they were unwilling to accept who Jesus was. Just as many people today are, refuse to accept who Jesus is. Oh, they'll say he's a good teacher. They'll say he's a, a guru or a mystic, but when you say he is the son of God, it offends them. And heavens, if we proclaim that Jesus is the only way of salvation to the world, people get all kinds of mad. How dare you say that God won't let anyone into heaven no matter what they believe? Isn't God supposed to be a loving God? But understand something. God did not send his one and only son into the world to suffer and die by hanging on a cross and shed his blood so you can believe in Buddha or Muhammad. He wants you to believe in Jesus and place your faith and trust in him. And it grieves God's heart when people turn away from the truth he's revealed and the love that he's shown. And it's not just in religious matters like that. People get offended when you speak the truth to them. When you tell a man it is God's will for you to be faithful to your wife and loving to your wife and not to run around on your wife, he gets upset because he can't run around and carouse with other women like he's been doing and still have a right standing before God. When we proclaim righteousness and holiness to a world that loves sinfulness, they get offended. And God must simply sit back and shake his head and grieve in his heart. After all that he's done and all that he's revealed of his great love for us, that we would turn and simply walk away he must still stand amazed at the lack of faith. 
The text I read to you a minute ago was the final one I wanted to share with you. It's the account of Jesus before Pilate. Put yourself in that time frame. You know the story. Jesus has been up all night. He's been beaten. He's been slapped around. He's been abused all night. Daylight comes and the Jewish leaders decide and come up with a plan of how they are going to accomplish what they desire to do, which is kill him. They bind him, take him to Pilate to have their desires carried out. You know about Pilate. He's a Roman procurator, the governor. He is the final authoritative word for Rome in Palestine. They bring Jesus in, and they begin to lay out all these accusations against Jesus. He's a king. He's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. All these things that are said about Jesus. And Pilate doesn't know what to do. He goes and begins to question Jesus, and Jesus won't answer. He gives no response. And it says, Pilate is amazed. Why? Well, put yourself in Pilate's place. He is the only one who has the absolute authority of life and death over every single person in Palestine. Every capital murder case or every capital punishment case comes before Pilate to be decided, will this person live or will this person die? And like any judge, he's used to people declaring their innocence or begging for mercy. And Jesus does neither. He simply stands there, ready to fulfill his mission. You see, he had come into this world for a very specific purpose. He had come to reveal what God is really like over and against the confusion of his day. Where there was judgmentalism and legalism, he revealed God to be a God of love and grace where people had set up rules and regulations and stipulations on getting close to God, Jesus revealed only through faith. Faith alone, trusting in God's grace alone, you have free access to God himself. He simply revealed the truth that was in God's heart. And having taught his disciples, having taught others, he was ready to fulfill the ultimate purpose for which he had come. He tells us, Mark tells us exactly from the lips of Jesus what that is. For the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus came into this world so he could stand before Pontius Pilate, be condemned to death, and nailed to a cross. Even Pilate was amazed, and so should we be. But I want you to understand that God's plan of salvation was very detailed and very thought out, and God had you in mind. I know I shared some of this on Christmas Eve. If you're here on Christmas Eve, please don't tune me out. You've already heard this story, at least part of it. But I think it bears repeating. How precise was God in his plan of salvation? God created the world in six days. We know that because that's what he reveals to us. On the third day when he spoke all the vegetation, all the vines and bushes and grass and flowers and trees into existence, he had his eye on one special tree that he created. Not the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, not the tree of life, but another tree. He watched over that tree. He sent the rain and the sun upon that tree, and it dropped a seed, and a sapling sprouted. And God watched over that tree and sent the rain and the sun and nourished it from the earth until it grew and matured and dropped a seed and a sapling sprouted. He watched that sapling and took care of it. Generation after generation after generations of trees, God watched over them, provided for them in successive generations for thousands of years until one tree dropped a seed. And God sent the sun and the rain and the nourishment and watched over that tree until it grew and matured. And he watched as it was cut down, as it was chopped and hewn into long, 
thick, heavy boards that would eventually be used to construct the cross upon which his son would die. God watched over the tree from the creation to the day the cross was made and prepared that tree for his son's death. But do you know why he did it? Because when God created Adam and Eve and watched as their descendants multiplied, he knew your generations. He watched a couple fall in love and give birth to a child. He took care of that child as it grew, matured and fell in love and gave birth to a child. For generation after generation, for thousands of years, he watched each generation reproduce and children born, and he watched the lineage of your family until finally two people fell in love. And as a product of their love, you were born. And standing before the beginning of creation, God looked all the way to you, living and breathing in this world, and he loved you. And he was determined that the cross would, the tree would grow to become the cross so you would have a savior, so you could be his child, so you could live with him forever. Like that little girl standing in the courtroom with her parents holding her tight, you will never hear the words unwanted spoken over you because God has always wanted you. And I pray today, it is we who stand amazed that God loves us, that God wants us, and that God has done everything through his son to have us for all eternity. Amen. And now may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus our Lord unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen.